Uh, brothers and sisters, I just want to welcome you to our service, and uh, I believe that uh, with God's power, uh, we you are going to enjoy the service and uh, be encouraged in every manner or way. So let us pray. Come humbly, Father. Come humbly, everyone, into the presence of God, whose power is made perfect in weakness. We know that without God we are nothing. Coming together, be bound together in the command of our strong God. Lord Jesus, we stand before you just as we are, with our needs, our problems. Sometimes we forget the power we have in you. Be among us, Lord. Be our strength. Thank you, Lord, that with you all things are possible. Amen to that, God. Amen. I would ask uh, my brother Ben to come and do the reading of the Word of God from uh, 2 Corinthians chapter um, uh, 12, verses 1 to 10. Okay. Praise God. Well, it's a, a bit of a wet day today here in Atherton. It's um, so awesome to be getting so much rain this year, and I'm sure the farmers are feeling really blessed. Uh, yeah, got this lovely shirt on. Uh, Johnson lent me, so I'd, you should have a read of it. It looks really cool. He reads from the Bible. Praise God. Uh, to, as he mentioned, today's reading is uh, from 2 Corinthians 12, 1 to 10. I must go on boasting, although there is nothing to be gained. I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether it was in body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I, would do, not, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise and heard inexpressible things that no one is permitted to tell. I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself, except about my weakness. Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool, because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain, so no one would be, uh, so no one would think more about me than is warranted by what I do or say. And because of these surpassingly great revelations, therefore, in order to keep me. From becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in my weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardship, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Wow, so true, so true. So, um, yeah, that's the word this week, and we'll get on to uh, hearing Johnson's message. Uh, can't wait. Bring open ears. Thanks, Johnson. Uh, once again, I greet you uh, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, today, my theme is, where is God when it hurts? Where is God when it hurts? If you have never asked the question, where is God when it hurts? One day you will. You may not need my message this moment, but you may need it in the next minute or the next month, or even next year, you may need that message. There are three basic problems that are common to everyone. Everywhere at some time in this life, there are sickness, sorrow, and suffering. You may temporarily escape one or even two of these, but you will never escape all three. That one I want to assure you. Even the most godly of people are not exempt from pain and suffering. 
the greatest Christian of all, the Apostle Paul, knew what it was to have problems. In fact, Paul closes the 11th chapter of 2 Corinthians chapter 12, telling how he had been whipped, shipwrecked, robbed, mugged, betrayed, jailed, and left dead. His highway of holiness and has been paved with hate, hate and hardship. In this chapter, he mentions a problem that was so difficult, so painful, so debilitating, that even with his great faith, he found himself asking the question, where is God when it hurts? Paul is talking about his own personal suffering. He is hurting. This pain and this suffering was so bad that he kept it a secret for 14 years. Nobody else had ever known about this problem until just now. This was a pain that had not left him for 14 years. It wasn't a pain that he had known every now and then or a day here or a, or a week here. For 14 years, none stop. He had known this terrible, horrible suffering. We don't know what it was, but we do know that Paul had and he had badly. It was through his pain, his hurt and his suffering that God taught him some of the greatest lessons of his ministry and of his life that I want to share with you today. In the first several verses of chapter 12, Paul speaks of unbelievable experience God had given him. God had allowed him to see things that no other man had ever seen. God had taken him to heights that no other person had ever scaled. On the heels of that great experience, God did something else. Even though I had received wonderful revelations from God to keep me from get, getting up, puffed up, I was given a thorn in my flesh. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. So that phrase, thorn in the flesh, is one of the most famous phrases in all of the Bible. We get the expression, a thorn in my, on my side, from that expression. So there has been a great debate over just what this thorn was. Some say it was poor eyesight. Some say it was a speech impediment. Some say it was a physical handicap. Some say it was his mother-in-law. Some interrupt Paul's use of the word here as a veiled reference to people who oppose the gospel. Whether the false teachers who were deceiving the Corinthians or the Jews who were actively opposing, opposing his teaching. According to the other commentators, the thorn had to be some type of temptation of the flesh. Medieval commentators usually suggested a sexual temptation. While commentators of the Reformation suggested a spiritual temptation. In any case, this sort of explanation suggests that Paul would have viewed this temptation as a hindrance to the gospel and would have been humbled by his weakness. Another set of commentators insist that the thorn in the flesh is a reference to a physical weakness, not to a persistent uh, temptation. So the earliest commentators on 2 Corinthians suggested that this element, element would, would have been severe headaches. These interpreters view the thorn in the flesh as a description of symptoms. In other words, it feels like a bar going through my head. Some doctors think Paul had recurrent malaria fever, a disease that includes migraine headaches. Many commentators, however, continue to insist that the thorn in the flesh is simply a general metaphor for Paul's physical weakness, especially in his eyes, and not a description of the symptoms. Some see hints in Paul's letter to the Galatians, chapter 4, verse 14 and 15, of a type of eye disease that impaired his vision. So Paul wrote, even though my eye, my illness was a trial to you, you did not treat me with contempt or scorn. Instead, you welcomed me as if I were an angel of God, as if I were Christ Jesus himself. What has happened to all your joy? I can, I can testify that if you would have done so, you would have torn out your eyes and give them to me. So Galatians 4, verse 14 and 15, sort of indicates that it was an eye problem. So the fact that the Galatians would have taken out their own eyes and given them to Paul is a strong evidence of eye problems. Moreover, the fact that Paul described his writing as so large also supports this theory in Galatians 6, verse 11. 
Whatever the thorn was, it is clear that it was a chronic debilitating problem which at times kept Paul from working and attending to his ministerial responsibilities. So the fact of the matter is, we don't know what this thorn was because we are not specifically told. I believe there's a reason for that. I believe that God purposely kept the identity of this thorn a secret to us for some reason. Because if this problem had, had been poor eyesight, then many people would say, well, that don't help me because I don't have poor eyesight. If it is proper been an impeded speech, then that would have been a comfort to those of us who have no impediment speech. Even if it had been a physical handicap, most people today are not physically handicapped. So this thorn remains anonymous because no matter what your particular thorn might be, the same God that gave Paul victory over his thorn can give you victory over yours in whatever situation you are. So we all have some pain. It doesn't matter what image we present to the world. It doesn't matter how much money we have in our bank account. It doesn't matter what degree or title we have at work. We all have weaknesses. And we all have got some pains in our life. The problem is that we live in a prosperous, image-driven society. Nobody puts their weakness or a struggle on Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat, whatever up they don't put. We only put our best, most airbrushed image out there. People to see, even when we are grieving, we are hurt, we are in pain, we put all these pictures, we show that things are okay. The last thing we want our friends to see is our flaws. We don't want people to see our flaws. We only want people to see the best of us. Some of our weaknesses are physical. Some are mental, some are moral. Some of these weaknesses have to do with our work, some with our family life, some with our relationship with Christ. Some of us, for example, have short tempers. Others struggle with depression or anxiety. Some of us are too proud. Others even lack backbone, which gives us too in quickly. We cannot even stand up for something we don't agree. We just give in. But all of us are weak in some area of our life. We don't have to debate why this stone had come into Paul's life. He tells us why that it was kept from him getting puffed up. And to keep him from getting proud. Can you hear? It's clear. So you understand whatever the pain was, the thorn was, it was to keep him from getting proud. Getting proud. Have you ever noticed that when everything is going great in life, it is sometimes very difficult to stay close to God? When things are okay, you want to tell the world that this is what is happening in my life. And you forget even that there is God's hand in everything that is happening in your life. We don't have to, to, to find out, to know how someone is different from Christ, we can see it from the, how the person lives. In fact, there's a tendency and a temptation when things are going great to think that things are so great. And because you are so great that it is so good, God is so good to you. Because you are so good to him. That's the reason behind. All these things are happening is because I'm so good to God. And God is so good. One of the biggest temptations we all face is to get a little too big for our spiritual breaches. Our very wise, patient, and loving Heavenly Father does not something for us that we think it is to hurt us, but it is really to help us. So when we find this pain, the thorn in the flesh, it's not there that God doesn't love us, but it is something to help us so that we grow in our Christian journey. Here is what he does. He balances the blessing with the burdens. First of all, God does give blessings. He put blessings right into our hands. Psalm 68 verse 19 says, Blessed be the Lord who daily loads us with benefits. Daily loads us with benefits. Daily loads us with blessings. But even in Psalm 68 verse 19, it says, God fills our hands with blessings, but he also puts burdens on our back. So to balance blessings in the other hand, Burdens on the other side. Do you know why God does that? If all God did was fill your hands with blessings, eventually you fall on your face. If He continuously loaded your back with burdens, you will fall on your back. So the Lord perfectly balances blessing and burdens so that we don't become overbalanced or fall in either direction. 
we are able to balance the situation. That is how I know that God stands with us in our suffering. Because that is exactly what he did with his own son, Jesus Christ. He gave, some, he gave more blessing to this world in three years of his ministry than any other human being has ever done in lifetime. Yet he also bore the burden for our sins when he went on the cross. He suffered there for you and for me. All you have to do is look at the cross and know that not only does God suffer for us, but God suffers with us. So whenever you are suffering, you are going through difficult times. It's not that you are suffering, but God is suffering with you. He's with you. When you come to that time in your life where you are in the middle of sickness, sorrow or suffering, just look at the cross. And remember that God stands with you in your suffering. My question was, where is God when it hurts? Remember that God is with you even when you are suffering. God speaks to us through suffering. How did Paul respond to this, to his suffering? The same way you and I have come, would come. Concerning these things, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. Oh. Listen, he was praying. I pleaded. Have you ever asked God to heal your, your, your sickness or relieve you of sorrow or alleviate your suffering? But he didn't do it. Well, join the club. That is Paul's life he's talking about. Three times Paul didn't just pray. He pleaded with God. He pleaded with God. He begged God to remove this stone, but God didn't do it. God didn't do it. There was nothing wrong with the prayer. There was nothing wrong with God. It, was, it wasn't that God didn't hear Paul's prayer. And it wasn't that God didn't care. No, he cared. Paul got an answer to his prayer. It simply wasn't the answer he wanted. It was the answer he needed. <laughs> Paul wanted God to deal with this problem by suppression. But he said God dealt with this problem by addition. That is what God does. Don't miss the next five words in verse 9 of 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. And then he told me, right in the middle of his praying, right in the middle of his pleading, right in the middle of his hating, right in the middle of his suffering, God spoke to Paul. Here's what he said, my grace is sufficient for you. Hallelujah. My grace is sufficient for you. In verse 9, my grace is sufficient for you. I want you to notice that Paul didn't get the answer he was looking for until he quit praying, he quit praying and he started listening. Sometimes we are so busy telling what God, what, what, what we want to God and what we want God ought to do for us that we can't hear. God telling us what he wants us to do. If you have a problem in your life and you have asked God to take it away, he hasn't maybe it is time for you to quit talking. And start listening. Start listening. Start listening to what God is saying. It was in the middle of Paul's suffering that God taught Paul some things he would never learn any other way. I had to be the bearer of bad news, although it may really is good news. But you are going to find out that you learn a lot more about God and you learn a lot more from God in the valley than you do on the mountain top. Do you believe the same God? God of the mountain is still God when you are in the valley. He's still God when things are good. He's still God when things go wrong. He remains the same. God can speak a lot more loudly sometimes in the bad times when he can in the good times. One of the things that suffering does is remind us of our mortality. It reminds us of just how frail we are. It reminds us of how just dependent God we really are and it forces us to focus on God. It tells you that your focus is not on anything else, it's on God. When you need help, you go on to God. When things are not doing well, you go to God. So this suffering, this pain made Paul to realize that God is there and to focus his attention on God rather than on the pain. That is why C.S. Lewis called suffering and pain God's megaphone. Here's what he said. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks to us in our conscience, but shouts to us in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Isn't that great? God's megaphone. 
God's answer to grief is grace. More than anything else in this world, God wants you to experience his grace. He wants you to experience it on a daily basis. There is no other thing where God shows his grace more strongly than in pain, sorrow, and suffering. In fact, remember this. There is no grace without suffering. And there is no grace apart from suffering. Every time you are suffering, if you will listen, God will be telling you and showing you, my grace is sufficient for you. The only problem is that you are not listening. You are busy asking yourself, where is God? We have already established that everybody is going to experience sickness or sorrow or suffering. God is there to strengthen us by our suffering. There is no such thing as pain free life. The issue is not, is something going to happen to me because you live long life? No. No pain life free. No pain free life, sorry. What determines victory or defeat is how you are affected by suffering. It leads to resistance, resentment, and bitterness. Then you lose out to depression and despair. If it leads to prayerfulness, patience, faith, and trust, then it can lead you to maturity and victory. That is exactly what we find in Paul's response. And then he told me, my grace is enough. It is all you need. My strength comes into its own in your weakness. Once I heard that, I was glad to let it happen. I quit focusing on the handicap and began appreciating the gift. It was a case of Christ's strength moving in on my own weakness. And Paul continued to preach the word of God. Now I take limitations to stride with good cheer. Those limitations that cut me down to size, that cut me down to abuse, accidents, opposition, bed breaks, I just let Christ take over. And so the weaker I get, the stronger I became. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, 10. The, the, the weaker I get, the stronger I became. Can you see that? Can you see how Paul has changed on 180 degrees? Before God spoke, all Paul wanted was to get rid of his problem. But after God spoke to him, he wouldn't take the world for it. He changed his mind. And he said, no, I'm really strong in my weakness. He now knows what it means. If on the other hand, one cannot change a situation that causes his suffering, he can still choose his attitude. You can look at suffering either as an enemy to avoid or as a master to surrender or as a servant that God can use to minister in your life. Whenever you are weak, God gets the opportunity to show his strength in your situation. So Paul struggled just like me. He had a thought in the flesh that he had prayed at least three times for God to remove. I now realize that my weakness is not my battle anymore. It's God's. In your weakness, it's not about you, it's about God. I still may have to deal with the physical limitations, but it is still not a battle. I no longer fight with it because it's a weakness. As Rick Warren has said, if you want to bless God to bless you and use you greatly, you must be willing to walk with a limb the rest of your life. Because God uses weak people. I'm still learning what all that means. But one thing I know, when I can't, he can. When I cannot do, God can. And I find it works. God could take the greatest pain and suffering in the history of mankind on a cross 2,000 years ago and turn it into salvation for all who would believe. In fact, God's son, Jesus Christ, endured the greatest suffering of all so that you and I would not have to endure the eternal pain and suffering of eternal apart from God. Because of Jesus Christ, we no longer have to fear pain. We no longer have to fear suffering in this life. And even more importantly, in the life to come, I'm not afraid of death. For because I know that I'm not going on my own, I'm going with him. Isn't that great for you to know? You are not supposed to be afraid because God is with you. Although Christ did not remove Paul's affliction, he promised to demonstrate his power in Paul's weakness. Knowing this, Paul welcomed times when he appeared weak or even powerless. He saw insults and hardship in a different way. 
They gave him opportunities to grow closer to Jesus Christ in prayer. So all the things that were happening to him were innocent to help him grow more spiritually. For when he was at his wit's end, when he had no options left, he would be forced to run to Jesus to rely on Christ's help. So Paul's other dependence on Christ came into clear light. This was not the only benefit of the persecutions or troubles. No, there are so many. At those times, Paul would look for Christ working in a marvelous and mighty way. So Christ's clear manifestation of his power and Paul's weakness would become a source of inspiration and the reason to praise and glorify Jesus Christ. Not only for Paul, but even for us, followers of Jesus Christ, wherever we are. So the fact that Christ's power is displayed in weak, people should give believers courage. Instead of relying on their own energy, effort or talent, they should turn to Christ for wisdom and strength. Weakness not only helps a person develop Christian character, it also depends that person's worship. Because admitting weakness affirms that Christ's inexhaustible strength can help you. I have found a lot of people that those who are challenged, those who are in pain, those who are suffering, are the ones who can come closer to God. They need God more than anyone else. So brothers and sisters, I just want to say to you, come to God. Come to God. When you think, where is God? When you ask the question, where is God? The answers are there. God is with you in the suffering. My grace is sufficient for you. In your suffering, I am present with you. You are not on your own. So may God bless you. May God help you to understand who he is. God be with you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us pray and thank God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you. We thank you, Lord, for the things that you have done. We thank you, Lord, that you are God. You are God, our Father. Thank you for the times when things go well for us. For those times when we seem to have everything we need and want. When things fall into place. When we are successful in the task we take on. Thank you for the unexpected gifts we receive for the people we enjoy being with. Thank you for the joys, the success and the high points in our lives. God, be with us when things go wrong. When we fall, fail or nothing seems to fit into place. When it feels like life is a struggle and we can't see any light. Wrap us up in your loving arms and remind us that Light is stronger than dark. And that you share our pain and give us the courage to keep going. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I invite you to Thanksgiving time where you think about what God has done into your life. I know there are a lot of things that God has been doing to you. And count all those blessings one by one. And you see what God has done to you. So it is time for you now to make your offering. You can use your phone, mobile phone, to do your giving. You can use your computer to do your giving. Or you can even send or deposit to the church account. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the blessings that you have given us. We thank you even through the sufferings that you have gone through. That we still know that our God is there. Thank you, God, for reminding us that through good times, through bad times, you are still our God. May you bless this offering. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us receive grace. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for everything that has happened. We thank you for this special service. We thank you that as we be going out, you want to be like Paul. Paul said, that's why I am contended with weakness, insults, hardship, persecutions, calamities for the sake of Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. 
wonderful, strong, mighty God. We go out in our weakness to share your power with those around us. Bless us in your saves, Lord. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all from now and evermore. Amen. God bless you all. In Jesus' name. Amen.